say so. I see the Jesus way. I'm walking in the light.
Let's give our Jesus a shout of praise. Welcome to the first ever 6.30 Saturday night at Mercy Road. This is historical, historical moment for our church. You guys may be seated. We are going to take our missional moment now. If you are new and this is your first time to Mercy Road, first of all, welcome. Please let the basket pass you by. There's no obligation to give. Uh, If you call this church home, please... uh, 
prayerfully consider tithing is, is actually an act of worship. Uh, this is, uh, we give our first 10%, not our last 10%, out of a worshipful heart for God, out of love, because we love and trust Him. So you, ushers, please come forward and welcome them and give them a round of applause, the usher team. They are incredible. They work hard every week. Now, take a look at this video. This is what's happening this week at Mercy Road. Good morning, Mercy Road. My name is Eric, and I'm your worship and missions pastor here. We are so glad that you joined us today at church, and I want to welcome all those who are joining us online as well. Hi, Mom. If you open up your program, you'll find this Connect card. This is our way of connecting with you throughout the week. Please take time to fill it out and place it in the basket as it comes by. And now for what's happening... Down the pipe at Mercy Road, we have a Mercy Women's event, September 9th. Mark your calendar. It's going to be an amazing time of worship, light breakfast, and a message from Teresa Poway. Don't miss it, September 9th. For Mercy students, we need you to know that your huddles will be during the 11 a.m. service, so be sure to mark your calendar for that. This Wednesday is First Steps with Josh class. Josh will be there, and it is August 23rd at 7 p.m. Don't miss it. Here at the Mercy Cafe, we have a whole assortment of different kinds of hazelnut and, and, and regular coffee and decaf coffee and, and even hot chocolate. So be sure to come out and find a refreshment, make a friend, hang out in the cafe after the service. And then finally, don't forget to get out your device this morning and share this service online so that your friends and your family can join us as well. And finally, it is time for my favorite part, the Social 45. Harvey, are you ready? Your Social 45 starts right now. Hey guys, put your hands together. Welcome to those who are joining us live online right now. Glad you guys are here. If you are in the service, which you are, you can pull that smartphone out. Share this on Facebook Live right now. It's going out to different parts, or you can go to mercyroad.tv and share it. Uh, excited to have you with us first Saturday night ever. It's been, we had more people at these two services than we thought we would have, starting this out for the very first time. It takes me back, man. If you are new to our church, we started just over five and a half years ago at Clay Middle School in Carmel. And I can remember before we started those services, when we would have like 20-some people in a room, and we'd be praying, and we would talk about, hey, someday there's going to be a whole lot more people worshiping with us. And you know what happened was we went to that little school, or not little, it's a big school in Carmel, and we had about 75, 100 people start getting involved. We moved over to this little building off of College Avenue, and the church started growing. We were literally meeting in about 5,000 square feet of usable space, like smaller than some people's houses. And it was, it was like a Cracker Jack box, man. I'm not making it up. In fact, one time, anybody remember when the pipes burst from the toilet upstairs? Michael, were you sitting under it? And the water literally started pouring on people. And I just kept preaching. Like, that's just what we do. And uh, like 100 people came to know the Lord that day. Um, I made that part up. But it was an awesome time. Like, that's just what we've done. This service and the one before it, I want you to look around you right now. A year from now, I want you to pray that we see all these, these seats right here of people who come to know Jesus Christ. And literally, we have seen that happen in the life of this church. And so if you're new here, and it's your first time with us, or it's your first time in a church in a long time, and you're not a Christian, and you're watching us live online, or you're here with us in this room, um, we started this church for people just like that. We say there's nobody too far from God to experience life change through Jesus Christ, that the church should be a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And we believe that. And we want to be real and we want to be relational. I want to get to know you. I'm going to be at the Connect Center right afterwards. What I love about this uh, new service time is we've got more time in between the services. I've been getting to know a lot of more people. And that's the, the fun part of this new season of life. 
Fun to be with you. If you have your Bible, power it on and turn to Acts chapter 4. We are going to look at one of my favorite passages of Scripture. As you're turning there, I want to share some stuff with you. Uh, We're starting a new teaching series called Underground Jesus. It's the only series we do once a year. We change it every year. But we talk about the underground aspect of what we do as a church. And it's the only time we got t-shirts that go on for sale. Didn't Megan do an awesome job this year with the t-shirts? You can wipe us out of those. We don't make any money off of them for $10 out of there um, just to pay for the cost of them. But we do that to remind us of who we are as a church. And that church looks differently in the New Testament than what many of us in our American church culture often think of. Man, when I first became a Christian, I was 19 years old. And I was living at a fraternity house. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine what my life was like then. And I remember coming to faith and beginning to live my faith out, share it with people. Started a Bible study in the fraternity house. We started ministry on campus and we began to see lives change. And I knew that following Jesus wasn't just about a profession of faith. It actually meant that he was changed my life. I am a new creation The old is gone, the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And I wanted to do something with the life that he had been given. And often when I went to a church service, I didn't get it. If I'm just being honest. Like, I I didn't get it. I was like, okay, so we come together and we sing songs every week. And then we go home and we don't do anything else the rest of the week. And then we come back and we sing songs together and somebody talks at us. And then we go home and they talk about us again next week. And and I began to think, like, I don't get it, because, like, when I read the New Testament, church wasn't just about a worship service. You see, what we're going to do in these four weeks together, I'm going to share tonight what our motto is as a church. The next week, I'll talk about what our model is. Then I'll talk about our mission, and then finally, the movement that we believe is occurring. Over the course of the next four weeks, if you just get one week, you're probably not going to get the full picture of who we are and what we're doing. And I would encourage you, if you consider yourself a Christian, find a church home. And if this one isn't it, there are lots of great churches in the area. We can connect you to some of them. But what I want to share with you in the series is how we're slightly different than maybe some of the other churches that do a worship service like ours with, you know, biblical but relevant teaching and passionate expression of worship. What I want to share with you is the underground aspect of who we are as a church. So i got to ask you a question. Like, when you think of church, what do you think of? Well, I think of, like, uh, on Sunday mornings, we got, like, Jack's Donut Holes, and we got coffee. Sunday nights, we got McAllister's Sweet Tea, baby. We got cookies out there. We still got the delicious coffee. We're going to spoil you on Saturday evenings. In fact, I threatened the staff. Maybe we'll take away the coffee from Sunday morning because those are the boring people, and we will, like, live extravagantly on Saturday nights. Who likes that idea, baby? Yeah, come on. Steak dinner. Eric's buying. But, uh, you know, I, I, I share that because I believe for us as a church right now, we are in a key moment um, in our history. One of the biggest things we've done in a while by going to Saturday nights has huge implications for what's going to happen in our future. And as I talk about our motto as a church, we put it everywhere. It's to live boldly and to love deeply. And when you think about what church should look like, what do you think of? Uh, Let me explain. Maybe you think about the worship gathering or a building. Okay, we got like kind of an old school building uh, that we can look at here. And that's, that's church to you. When Jesus uh, was walking on the planet and the three years of active ministry he had, he probably went to the the synagogue. We know that. It wasn't like he didn't attend that. But but when did he make that the primary aspect of what he came to do? You don't see it. In the early church, they did gather together in the book of Acts. We know that. But it was to celebrate what God was doing throughout the week in their lives. We believe that our worship services would be relevant, biblical, and we want to express worship to God. But the rest of the week, we want to be a community on mission, being scattered throughout Indianapolis and Hamilton County and the other counties surrounding it to make an impact beyond just what happens here. Uh, the Protestant believers call that the priesthood of all believers, that we believe you, yes, you, if you know Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God is in you, and you are empowered to live on mission. And we want to help you do that very thing. And so if you all you know is the worship service of our church, you only know the above-ground aspect of what we do. 
you don't get to see all the below ground aspect of what we do, the root system, if you will. I'll be explaining that analogy in two weeks on September 2nd here on Saturday nights and uh, September 3rd on Sunday mornings. And we'll be sharing with you what our mission truly looks like. We don't just want to be a worship gathering. In fact, when we started this church over five and a half years ago, we started five outposts before we even started the worship service. Our outposts are smaller communities making an impact in their uh, cities and towns. And we did that so that people would understand that was every bit as much church as what we do at our gatherings on the weekends. And so as we go through our motto, our model, our mission, and our movement, and you think about what comes to mind as a church, I hope you begin to think about the underground aspect of what we do. Because when did Jesus attend the worship service? When did he even uh, lead the disciples in an inductive Bible study? Right? He doesn't do a lot of that. And yet, I believe the New Testament teaches we should gather weekly in worship. Hebrews talks about that. I believe that uh, the living word is in Scripture and that we should study it because it connects us with Jesus Christ. The statistics show you're much likely get, to get divorced and have other issues in your life uh, if you actually read Scripture on your own and you worship together with other Christians on a regular basis because God begins to work in your life more. So they're valuable things, but we often make them the primary things. The first Christians were so serious about the mission of Jesus that they didn't have time for what we, most of us think in our culture, are the most important parts of doing church. Isn't that interesting? And so maybe you're here or you're watching online and you've been to a church service before and you've heard about uh, Jesus in Scripture and we're going to study Acts 4 pretty in depth here. But you've never actually said, I want to be a part of that team. What's the greatest team in human history? There's, there's a correct answer to this. I thought it was the 76 Hoosiers basketball team, but it turned out that was second. The, the best team in human history was the A team, baby. Come on now. <laughs> Children of the 80s. You know, you remember B.A. Baracus and Murdoch and Facebook? Man, my personal favorite was Hannibal because he loved it when a plan comes together. You're going to get to see the plan of what our church is founded on and the scriptures that base it. And our motto of live boldly, love deeply that you see comes from Acts chapter 4. And I believe we got to stop thinking as church is this boring thing that you attend. Like, I think we got some great speakers, especially the last three months while I was gone. But I'll tell you what, I don't care if you got the greatest speaker in the world. If you just go sit in a seat once a week, you are missing out on the exciting part of doing church. That's what this series is about. The underground aspect of our faith of following Jesus Christ. It's what you see throughout the book of Acts that we're studying, the church scattered. It's what you see in the movements of Jesus that are uh, historically making a huge impact. In fact, up until the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, that's when uh, Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the church. I got a little picture of a thing uh, that they made to uh, memorialize that. Up until that point, 313 AD, Christians were persecuted for their faith. In fact, in the second century, 100 years earlier, or 150, Christians were burned at the stake in parts of the Roman Empire for their faith. And then they would take the ashes of the body and they would scatter it in the local river so that as the ashes dissipated, they would laugh and say, ha, 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 try and resurrect that body now. And yet by 313 AD, it's made the official religion of the church up those first 300 years, the early church, through oppression, expanded rapidly. Why? Because they didn't need a public worship gathering to fulfill what Jesus had called them to and what the New Testament tells us. That's the beauty of it. It's why the Moravians expounded rapidly. It's why the Methodist churches that you see today in American culture, because they didn't have to have somebody trained at a seminary, they'd just disciple them, and then they'd send them out, just ordinary people on a horse, to the next town over to share about Jesus. And the word spread rapidly. And then I love the underground church in China today, even though it is difficult to practice your faith there unless you uh, uh, go by the public Christianity that the state has, that the, the underground church in China has expanded rapidly because God's mission cannot be stopped by any oppression. 
And even sometimes it forces us to figure out what we truly believe. Is it just some gathering and a show we put on? Or is it actually Christians committed to Christ's cause? To live on mission. To live boldly and to love deeply in our spheres of influence. Will you pray with me? God, uh, we pause for just a second and we acknowledge the presence of your Holy Spirit with us. I think of all the services this weekend, God, I've been most excited about this 630 service because I truly believe that this is a, a time that there's not a, a, a lot of places that are reaching people for Christ right now. And we can invite our friends that are searching out the things of faith to this place right here every weekend. God, we pray you'd use this service. We dedicate it to you. As we read Acts chapter four, We pray you speak to us how to live out our faith boldly, to love people deeply right where they're at. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's family said, amen, amen. Acts chapter four, beginning in verse one, says this. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Then get this. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Leave that up there for just a moment. So the book of Acts starts with Jesus ascending to the right hand of the Father. In verse 8 of chapter 1, it says that the Christians are called to go to Jumea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you are called to go out and tell people about how Jesus has changed your own life. By the time we get to Acts chapter 2 and 3, eventually the Christians are growing in number. And Peter presents the gospel and 3,000 people receive faith. At the beginning of Acts chapter 4, they had just healed a man who was lame, meaning he couldn't walk. Not that he wasn't cool. And all of a sudden he can walk. People are talking about it in town. And now, in this passage, they go and proclaim their faith, and it said an evening, and really it was about three in the afternoon, interesting when Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross, but at three in the afternoon, uh, they were taken and put into jail because he couldn't have a trial at night. And so the trial would take place the next day, and they are thrown into jail simply because of their faith. Could you imagine that? And then at the end of verse four, it said that 5,000 men 5,000, and literally the word there is man, that it's actually talking about men here, come to faith in this passage. Now, scholars believe there was at least 25,000 people in Jerusalem and perhaps as many as 85,000 people. Somewhere to 50 to 60,000 people, most likely in Jerusalem at the time. And at this one moment, 5,000 men are, have now surrendered their life to the Lordship of Jesus. That would be like in Carmel if all of a sudden like 10,000 people just all of a sudden became Christian one day. That's what's happening. The word has gotten out. It is spread and they are imprisoned for their faith. When was the last time you took a risk for God in your life? When was the last time you took a risk at all? Has anybody done something really risky or bold lately? Anybody out there? Come on now, the last service, somebody went skydiving. That's just crazy, kind of one up me. But anybody done anything crazy out there? Anybody, you're like, I'm never going to raise my hand no matter how many times you ask me. Let me tell you, I took a big risk this week. Maybe not as big as the risk uh, that you took. Like Luke over there likes to rock climb and do truly risky things. I uh, took my two-year-old to get ice cream. Parents, have you ever taken a two-year-old to get ice cream? Here's how the, here's how the day went. Um, my wife was sitting down front here, and she, and she goes, hey, why don't you go to get us some ice cream, um, which I really wanted to. And so we went to our favorite place, Handles, to get the ice cream. And I said, hey, I'm such a good, loving husband. Why don't I take my daughter, Jenna, with me to go get ice cream? Because my daughter is the sweetest thing in the world. I swear wolves could raise her. Like, it's really easy. And she said, hey, why don't you take Jet with you? <laughs> this is my eight-year-old down here. You know, and Jet's a little wild child. And I I looked at him, and Jet wasn't wearing any clothes at the time. And I was like, honey, I'm not doing it. She said, please. I said, okay. And so I took Jet with me. Now, dads, come on. We don't really think through these things. So he just had a, uh, my son is like two and a half. He's still in diapers. 
and this is a little graphic, so I apologize, but it's a true story. I took him, he's just in his diaper, I put him in the car seat, and I thought, oh, we're going to Handles, man, you can just uh, order the ice cream outside, I'll be a slightly bad dad, leave the car running right next to where I'm getting the ice cream, so I can see what's going on, I'll get the ice cream. Get there, anybody guess what's happening at Handles? There is a line like 12,000 people long. I have to park the car like 300 feet away from the ice cream place. I start to walk towards the store and I realize I don't want to go to jail. So I went back, got the two kids, took them with me. Now remember, my son is not wearing any clothes. So at that time, I thought he can't go up there naked. So I put my eight-year-old's clothes, who had those clothes, he wasn't in the car. His clothes were in the car. I put them on the two-year-old. Have you ever seen a two-year-old wearing eight-year-old's clothing? And I get up there, and I'm holding him. He's squirming like crazy. And then I realize, dads, you know, what parents, you know what he did next. Right there, we just got in the line. I'm going to wait about 20 minutes, and he pooped his pants. Right? <laughs> can I say that? Is, am I allowed to say that? Like, that's what happens. I could say it in a lot nicer way, but that's what happened. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And then he's squirming. And I'm like, I'm not holding them because parents, you know, it's like all resting there. Like there are layers between, but you don't want to be holding them. So I take him back to the car. I'm like, we're going to Kroger. We're getting cheap ice cream, baby. I drive to Kroger and then it hits me. Dads, we don't think through this stuff. Like I got to take him into the store with me now. And so I take him in there and I'm like, oh, I'll just make him sit in the cart. Moms, he's, yeah, he's two. He's not going to sit in the cart. And so I'm taking the the cart through the grocery store. And about every 30 seconds, he stands up, dad, and the pants go down. And I'm like, oh, and I run over, I pull the pants up. I'm like, sit down, sit down. I'm going to be in so much trouble. I literally, I get to the ice cream place. I take all the ice cream I could get. And Lisa didn't. I piled like uh, so much ice cream, about like $50 worth of ice cream, stuffed it in the cart, drove home. I get there. I said, honey, I'm never doing that again. (laughs) Parents, you been there? I promise you there's a point to the story. For some of us, when it comes to church, we've tried it before. Maybe you took a little risk and you tried to get to know somebody at church. Or maybe you took a risk this morning to come and worship or this evening worshiping with us. And you've tried to do the thing before. Maybe even trust in Christ before and you've prayed prayers and he didn't answer them maybe the way that you wanted him to. Some of you have been hurt. You've been hurt by people in a local church. They've gossiped about you. They've said things behind your back. For some of you, they maybe even did some things that have left permanent damage in your life. I don't know. And you've said to yourself, I've tried it. I'm never doing it again. See, the type of risk that we're talking about is more than just taking a two-year-old to get some ice cream. We're talking about risking our life in a social sense to join this community on mission, to join this family and say, God, I believe that I can make a bigger impact together than we can apart. I want to represent what I read in Ephesians 4.13, that it's only when we use our gifts together that you see the full measure of Jesus Christ. We are to be the body of Christ. I'm not going to lead a siloed Christian faith anymore. Alone by myself, I'm going to unite with other believers and to live on mission, to do what they say in the New Testament, but you're fearful because you've been hurt before. What I want to share with you is for to us, each of us, whether we've been Christian for 50 years or this is our first time searching out the things of faith. I just talked to a woman at the last service who committed her life to Christ, who it was her first time ever participating in a church. I want to tell you the things that we're talking about are worth it. To live boldly, to love deeply in our sphere of influence as they do in Acts chapter 4. You see, in In verse 13 of Acts 4, where we get the phrase that you see on our doors and our website, live boldly, it says this in verse 13. You see, they get out of jail. They go and present the good news there to everyone that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. And they get to verse 13, and it says, when they saw the courage of Peter. If you've got a pen and you're looking at your Bible or you're on your phone or your iPad, highlight courage there. Literally, it's the Greek word parisia. Parisia, and it means boldness or courage, outspokenness, assurance, confidence, without fear. Anybody in your faith need a little Parisia right now? 
Because it's what happens here in verse 13 that I think is earth-shattering in the early Christian movement. They saw the courage, the boldness, the Parisia of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. Literally, the word ordinary here, are you ready for this? I didn't write this, is idiotous. You know what that means. Literally, they're saying, these are unschooled, ordinary men. They're saying, these guys are idiots. <laughs> like, how could they possibly be able to articulate faith in Jesus like that? They, they couldn't know that. These were literally uneducated um, men. And they say this, this is really important. They were astonished and they took note that these men had what? Been with Jesus. They looked at that person's life and they said, this person had to have been with Jesus. It's the only thing to explain it. When was the last time someone was amazed by your boldness, by your parisia, by your courage in your faith? Where they were like, oh man, that woman, that guy, they had to know Jesus because that's the only way that's possible. You see, I find it interesting that even Peter, who's one of the people in this passage, had denied Jesus three times not too long ago. So if you're sitting there going, dude, you don't understand. Like, my life's a mess. I'm not going to be somebody that does the things you're describing. I bet you haven't denied Jesus Christ uh, three times just recently. And this man will go on and heal somebody, lead 3,000 people to know Jesus in Acts 2 and 3, and then we get to chapter 4, and now he's living his faith out so boldly, he's actually in prison for it, and people are going, he must be with Jesus. I think it's only our time, plus our faith, plus boldness, parisia, that leads to spiritual results in our life. I'll leave that up there for just a moment, because it's, for many of us, we may believe in Jesus We may even have uh, real authentic faith and spend time with him. But if we don't take even a a little bit of risk, I gave a story of some small risk in my life and it didn't turn out the way I thought. And many of us don't take risk because we're afraid of what's gonna happen. When was the last time you took risk or lived boldly? I remember one big time I did and it didn't turn out the way I wanted. And I never wanna go through it ever again. And it's one of the best stories I have in my faith. I don't ever want to take my two-year-old for ice cream again. <laughs> but I got a story to tell. And I believe spiritually that's what it's like. And I want more stories in heaven. I don't know about you. You see, when we first moved here, many of you know our story. But in case you didn't, when my wife and I first moved here, our son that's right down here, he was a year and a half old at the time or two years old. And we found out we had a, our unborn son had a genetic disorder and was supposed to die in the womb. And we did something that makes a left-brained People like myself, I love math. I was good at chemistry in school, believe it or not. I like the left side of the brain. All you creative weirdos out there, and what's wrong with you, Eric? But I'm not like that. And we began to pray that my son would be supernaturally healed by God. Totally out of my comfort zone. Maybe that's out of your comfort zone. And we saw things happen where my son, he, he didn't die in the womb, as they told us. He made it full term. And then he was supposed to die that night, and then he kept living after the night he was born, and he ended up making it a week, and they said, you might get to take him home. Couldn't believe it. And God was answering our prayers. We knew it, and then he failed a breathing test, and over the course of the next week, he took a turn for the worst, and two weeks to the minute he was born, we actually pulled the plug, and he ended up passing in the next 30 minutes. Most horrible thing. I never wanted to ever go through that ever again. And yet, through that horrible experience, where I was upset with God, God took that and made it one of the greatest stories of our life. Many of the people who ended up finding faith and becoming a part of Mercy Road in the early days were because of my son's story. We, we saw uh, hundreds of people across the country uh, surrender their life to Christ as I shared his story in different locations and places. And I remember one time seeing a number of people give their life to Jesus and just being drawn to tears. I remember uh, a man who was in Afghanistan serving in the military who read about our son online and returned to the faith. I remember a Wiccan woman who was going to abort her son and instead decided to give birth to him and named him Jackson after her son. Like, never want to go through any of that story again, but it's one of the greatest stories of faith I've ever had. And so 
I believe that time plus faith plus boldness leads to spiritual results. It's often the paresia, the boldness, the courage that we miss out on in our lives. And maybe for you, it's, it's going to be some small courage. You need to actually connect to a local church like this. The first step class is coming up this week. You can sign up. It's not too late. You can do it on the app, fill out a card, turn it in at the back. Maybe some of you are going to take some bold steps, some courage in your faith to begin to say, you know what? I party every weekend. Been there. Do some things I'm not proud of. I'm going to begin to allow God to invade even that area of my life. Maybe some of you, you're here, you're watching online, you're just like, man, I keep dating people who don't love Jesus. And I know I've got a bad habit. I'm going to let him invade that area of my life. I've been avoiding the issues in my marriage or the issues in our family. I'm going to stop doing that. I've been avoiding the debt that surrounds us, and I haven't allowed God to invade that aspect of my life. I'm going to invite him into that. I'm going to start living with some courage, with some parisia, with some boldness. God calls us to live boldly. I find it, like, scary what happens in verses 29 to 31. See, they're going to get out of prison. They're going to go back to where the other Christians are. And I don't know about you, but if I had just been uh, having a whole lot of parisia that got throat, me thrown into jail, the last thing I'd be praying for is more boldness. Amen? But look what happens here in verse 29 to 31. It says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Wasn't it the boldness, the Parisian that got them in trouble in the first place? But the early Christians, they go back and they share the story. They said, that wasn't bold enough. You were only in prison for a night. You can do better than that. I hope today we don't live in a culture where you should go to jail because of your faith, but you could begin to live with more courage the way the early Christians did Verse 30, it goes on, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. I got to tell you, um, I really don't have time for this story, but I'm going to share it anyway, because it was memorable in my life. When the church was three years old, or maybe two years old, we had our first birthday bash at the little building over at College Avenue that I described earlier. We baptized 12 people at one service that day, literally in a horse trough, <laughs> freezing cold ice water. And I'll never forget, as we started to do the baptisms, it still freaks me out to this day, the ground we were standing on began to shake. And you're going to think I'm weird and I'm crazy, I'm some cook. Like, I don't really, you know, I struggle with that stuff a lot. It freaked me out so badly, I didn't go, oh man, Jesus is in our midst, he must be with us. I said, somebody call the engineers, something's wrong with the building, I think we're having an earthquake. And the engineers who owned the building came and looked through the whole building and they could not find anything wrong with the building. To this day, it freaks me out. And when I read this passage, I really think this is what, what they were just talking about. It actually happened. The place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God, what? Boldly. We almost named this church Moxie Church. Who's glad we didn't do that? Yeah, me too. But because it meant to have guts, to live with boldness in our suburban American Midwestern faith where it's just assumed that because you grew up around Christianity that you must be a Christian, but the rest of your life every week doesn't look anything like Jesus. We wanted to say we were going to live with some guts spiritually and boldly, not weird and scary, but like the way that you read about in the New Testament. That's how this church was founded, that the above ground worship service is just one aspect, but we're called to live on mission in community, making an impact. God created you for that. And if you don't have it, you have empty in your life. See, they didn't just live their faith boldly. They actually loved each other deeply in a way that I, I think many times for American Christians, it's really hard for us. It totally gets us out of our comfort zone. Uh, look with me in uh, verses 32 to 37. It goes on and says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Hippies. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed among those who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money to put it at the apostles' feet. 
Now, look, I think we mess this passage up all the time. We go, oh, we, communism's been tried. It doesn't work. This has nothing to do with politics or socialism, any of that kind of stuff. This was talking about how the church was supposed to love each other. Love each other. Like family. Like, if, if you had a son or a daughter who's playing baseball or softball, and they got hit in the mouth with a baseball, and it knocked all their teeth out, how many of you as a parent would just go, oh, too bad for them? <laughs> Hope they figure out a way to fix that. That's your kid. You'd be like, we got, we got to get him to the dentist. We got to help him. I, I literally had that happen to me when I was in high school. Like, when family is in trouble, you step in and help out. Don't you find it interesting what Jesus says about family? Matthew chapter 12, it says this. He replied to, to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. He says, this is my family. This is my family. The church exists. The church exists so when life knocks the teeth out of us or out of someone, their spiritual family can step in and help out. And maybe some of you need that this evening. This church is full of people who have needed that, and God has made them a new creation, revolutionized their life, And now they're helping other people just like them and the things that they went through. It's why when we love each other deeply, this is family, man. Like when you come into the services, you want to put your feet up. It's cool because we're just hanging out. It's family. You're hanging out at the, like it's your couch at home. That's what family does. We should love each other in the way that when we see someone else being hurt, we should care enough about it. It's why I posted online this week. I mentioned last week. We can think of what, all we want about the politics who we voted for. I'm not, I don't care about that. But when it comes to blatant white supremacist racism, we care as Christians. Because if you're not African American or Jewish or some of the ethnicities that were uh, being portrayed and being hateful towards, then we as Christians should go, uh uh-uh, uh, that's my brother or my sister in Christ. That's my family. And I care about those things. That's what church looks like. That's what the, we are called to do. And that doesn't just have to do with the worship gathering. That's what happens as we live out on mission, the underground secret mission. God is calling us to as followers of Jesus. And I love seeing the Christians there peacefully. And I think that's important, peacefully praying for uh, the, the, the town Charlottesville and what was occurring there. We should care about it. I remember when a single mom came to us and she was in financial need. We didn't just go, too bad, sorry about you. We said, hey, why don't you come hang out with us? We want to get to know you, relationally help you, not just give you money either. We want to get to know you and help your family. That woman's name was Christina Huffines. We've shared her story before. I got a a great picture of her. And she actually uh, went on to become a Christian. Her kids became followers of Jesus. They all got baptized at the old building. And now a few years later, she runs a ministry called Dotted Line Divas. And through extreme couponing, helps other uh, families in need just like she has been. And just today, one of our outposts helped them open up their brand new location on 86th Street at the Union Chapel Methodist Church. It's going to help hundreds and hundreds and thousands of families around here. It's been all over the news and on the radio. And it happened because a church just loves her well. And now she's sharing that with others. I didn't ask permission for these because we're family. It's cool. Uh, Teresa Lee, man. I have mentioned this before. I've been seeing her post online about the work she's been doing for Food for Souls. She was one of those 12 people that got baptized. She had been a Christian, but she recommitted her life. And now she's been helping uh, homeless people uh, throughout Indianapolis uh, Rich Abbott, one of my favorites, baby. He came to faith through pub theology and started a mission for wrestling fans, a, a ministry called Wrestling Theology. We've got another event coming out. That's actually one of the bushwhackers right there. It was right here in this room for a wrestling event. We put a ring up in the middle of the room. It was crazy. That's what happens when people come to know Jesus and they experience the love of people around them. They want to go share that with other people That's what our motto as a church looks like. It's why we tell people to live boldly and to love deeply in our sphere of influence. I remember Tenoria asked you, I don't have a picture. She's all over the television. She was a top four finalist in MasterChef, and she runs our hospitality team. 
She's on the TV sometimes hearing her talk, and I love when she gets to give credit to her faith in Jesus. She had grown up a Christian, but at Clay Middle School, in one of her early services, she uh, recommitted her life to Jesus in a difficult time. And since then, she reclaimed her God-sized dream and said, I love to cook. I want to be a chef and tell people about Jesus and help those in need. And she just started doing it. And the next thing you know, she was on Master Chef, and now she has her own business, Tenoria's Table. That's sometimes how God leads us. We should hurt when our family is hurting. One person uh, right now that I know has gone through some difficult stuff in her life, and I talked to her mom last week. She's currently in in Hamilton County Jail. Um, She's made some choices that caused that. And she's back there, and I told her mom that our outpost would write some letters to her. And I began to think about preaching this message, and I was like, we should tell the church about this. How cool would it be just to overwhelm her with letters while she's there? Let her know that Jesus loves her right where she's at, and he's not done with her, and he can use her. This is her address, and it is Cumberland Road. There was a misspelling at the last service for those watching online. I encourage you, get your phone out, take a picture, write it down on something. Please, please, please consider just writing a quick letter this week to Allie Becker uh, there. She committed her life to Christ for the first time at the old building and got baptized over there. Hadn't seen her in a, at least a year or so. I've been going through some tough stuff, and I thought, man, that's family. We should step in and do something. Some of you right here in this room, you may be hurting, and you need some Parisia and some courage some bold faith in your life. You need somebody to love you deeply right where you're at, not to judge you. That's our motto as a church, to live our faith out boldly, to love each other deeply the way that we read the early Christians did in Acts chapter four. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for everybody that came out here at 6.30 on a Saturday night. God, I, I thank you for all these people. We pray, Jesus, that this is the start of something huge. God, that we would love each other right where we're at. That, yes, we'd love outside these walls. We exist for the sake of the world, but the greatest way they can see our love for them is to see our love for each other right here. And so if there's anyone hurting right now, anybody broken, may you just confess that to the Lord. Not not out loud, but just quietly right now. I believe his spirit is with us. He can hear it. Our prayer warriors in our prayer room would love to pray with you if you need to talk through anything or just to pray together so you got another Christian praying for you. I'm going to do it right after this. But maybe there's somebody, even one or two people in this room right now or even more. We had a number at the last service that said, you know what? I've known about Jesus, but I've never really become a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I have never fully surrendered my life to Jesus. And I want to do that. I want to begin to live my faith boldly. I want to begin to love others well. If that's you right now, I invite you to pray this silently as I pray it out loud. God, I confess that I'm not perfect. Forgive me for my wrongdoing. Thank you for your crucifixion and resurrection that I can know you, God. Thank you that you love me right where I am. So on this night... August 19th, 2017, I surrender my life to you fully, Jesus. May you use me, unite me with other believers to live on mission with you. And then right now, with our eyes closed, if, if you prayed that, even just one of you, you prayed that right now to surrender your life to Jesus, would you raise your hand for a second? I want to pray something specific with you. I see you right there. Thank you. And the two of you back there, I see you. You on my right side over here. Let me look over here to the left. I want to pray something specifically with with you for the two people that raised their hand. If there's anybody else at home right now, maybe God's working in your life. You want to raise your hand. Nobody can see you, but God sees you. That's the important part. God, these two people here have said they want to give their life to you fully. I think that takes courage, Parisia, that we just talked about, to be willing even to raise their hand and say that and confess that. So God, I pray you honor that prayer. Connect them, help them to not leave this place without talking to somebody about their faith, about what their dream is, of what they could look like in their faith with you, Jesus. That they'd find people to connect with here in the church and to live on mission and to do life together with. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you for tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's family said, amen, amen. Can we celebrate as we stand and close and worship together? It's been a fun night. 
We're going to sing one more song of worship. We love each other because we exist for the sake of the world to make an impact in our community, to be the church gathered around the city. If anybody needs prayer, we'd love to pray with you over here. But let's worship together.
give us your boldness as a church for the sake and for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire Yes, Jesus, thank you. We love you so much, God. Thank you for this wonderful night. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much for joining us on Saturday night at 630 to worship with us. As you leave this place, hey, by the way, you get to sleep in tomorrow morning, right? That's like, that's good news, right? But seriously, uh, next week, please join us for part two of Underground Jesus. Thank you, Josh, for such a powerful, powerful message that the, the real work of the church has done underground. Don't forget this this week. As you leave this place, please live boldly, love deeply for the sake of the world. You are dismissed.